Hello folks, welcome back. Today we have another movement from a standard electric time master clock. This was sent in by a viewer who asked me to refurbish this and uh, wanted to take a look at it and compare it to the clock that we've already worked on. This movement is somewhat different than the movement that we did before. The one that I have has contacts off of the escape wheel set up quite a bit differently than how this one works. Uh, this one, power comes in through the movement plate from the iron movement frame. There's a contact here that provides power all of the time to the escape wheel shaft. And then these three contacts here, this one, this one, and this one up here, draw power at different uh, times, positions as the escape wheel goes around. You can see the pin right here, if I let the clock run. There's the pin on the left side of the escape wheel. And on the back is this contact right here, which makes contact with this terminal. So the principle is roughly the same. The difference is this clock provides power to the terminals for a longer period of time. My clock provides a one second pulse based on the contacts coming in and out with the uh, motion of the verge and the smaller size of the contacts on the wheels. This one, they seem to make contact for about eight to 10 seconds. On the front of this, we've got some other contact, which on the hour wheel, there's a little nub that's coming around. You can see it right here. And this nub pushes on this contact, you can see it moved there, moved this, this way. You can see that we have an insulating spacer between these. So there's metal here and then a gap before this contact. Now, if we look really closely, we can see that there's probably something wrong here. This contact here has a pin that goes between it. And much like how the rest of these contacts work, it's a, a double little diving board thing. This has that same um, two contacts with a gap set up, but it's actually set up, very hard to show this, so that one, one of those contacts is on either side of the pin. So essentially, it's always in contact with this left contact. So I believe that's incorrect. We'll have to take a look at that. To get this running, we need to do some reverse engineering of how the electrics work on this because we don't have the whole clock. There's wiring, solenoids, other contacts that exist outside of what I was sent here. And we can infer some things based on the clock that we've already worked on. Um, basic mechanism is the same. We've got our winding solenoids here that pull on this contact, which then acts like a ratchet to raise this bar, which advances our wheel. And just like on our other clock, there's this torsion spring in between, which is what actually provides the force that continuously drives the time movement. Now this viewer tells me the clock actually runs if this is manually advanced, but it does not uh, advance electrically. So what we're gonna do is uh, take a quick look at the movement I have in the other clock and get our bearings I'm going to get this apart and we'll get it cleaned and then we'll try to get it running. One thing I wanted to notice and is a good thing to do before you actually do the cleaning is you can see sometimes the grime gives you clues as to what's different. This clock is missing a contact on this right arm here. If you see on the left side, we've got our double contact inside there and this right arm doesn't have one. And so there used to be something here. You can see kind of a difference in the color of the metal. Um, that's where oxidization happened, where the contact wasn't. So this existed at some point and then was removed. And if we look at this other contact up here, this one does essentially, well, it triggers from the same place, this, this pin. And I don't know if this was a retrofit. It looks like it's old, so I, I kind of don't think so. Um, so this clock may be missing something that matters. And I don't know um, if this person has slave clocks or bells. The good news is I believe we can make this at least keep time 
because we do have several good contacts. And essentially, this movement is just a, a switch that has you know three different outputs on it, and we can repurpose one of those to run the time movement if we need to. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take a look at just uh, how this compares to the other clock, and then we'll get this cleaned up. For comparison, here is the movement that we worked on in the earlier video series. You can see that the contact mechanism on this clock is quite a bit different than the movement that I received from our viewer. You can see the contacts moving on the right side of the escape wheel. And right now, we advanced our slave. And so that is a different system that involves the contacts that ride on the verge. The clock that we're working on today just uses the pins. It is similar in how the movement is energized. Right here is how the power goes to the clock bracket, through the frame, through this contact into the back of the wheel. And in essence, it's, it does the same thing where the, uh, the other side of the circuit switch, which is essentially what this movement does, are these, these outputs here. So we've got the same switch function. It just works a little differently in the clock that we have. Now, as I mentioned, since we only have the movement of the other clock and not all of this other stuff, we have to make some guesses as to what we need to actually have the movement wind itself. We need a snubbing resistor here to get rid of the arc, and we also need to use one of these switch contacts with our external power source to trigger our solenoid. I think we can make that work. And I believe that movement should still fit in this clock for testing. So I think we're going to be okay. But um, this is what we are shooting for. So we'll see if we can reproduce a, a kind of a quick test electrical circuit of that before we take the new movement apart. I've set up a test electronics lab here to see what the clock needs to run. I've got my adjustable DC power supply. I've got the connections across the solenoid of the clock movement. And I have this resistor here which will arrest the arcing that would otherwise happen on the clock contacts. It's a good idea to have this, otherwise we'll, uh, that arc will cause pitting in our contacts and that will wear out prematurely. I know the coil is good because I measured it at about 220 ohms. If the coil was bad, it would read either basically zero or infinite, an open circuit. Because I'm getting a value of a, you know, a reasonable quantity, I know that the solenoid coil is actually good. On my power supply, right now I've got the output voltage set to 5 volts, and the second line here you can see this power supply allows me to set a maximum current limit. It's set to a half an amp, and that's a level that should keep any power going through the clock low enough so that if there's a short circuit or power goes somewhere it's not supposed to go to, then I'm not going to do any damage. So I'm going to cycle the power supply for a second, and we will see what happens. We'll see if we can get it to unwind the, the ratchet. Okay, so there's our first pulse. You can see that. If I do it again, we can watch our current. This shows 0.03 amps, which is 30 milliamps. And I can actually hear the movement ticking, but it's not enough to wind. Let's see if I can get a camera shot that kind of shows what we're trying to get to on the clock, which is this, this guy's supposed to go up. All right, so we'll kind of sacrifice the power supply view to look at the clock movement, and you can take my word for where we're at here. I'm going to increase the voltage on the power supply to 8 volts. Okay, and you see it's actually lifting, but it's not strong enough to advance the wheel. I'm going to go up to 12 volts now. And it's a little hard to tell the difference, but it seems to get where it's going a little bit faster. Go up to 18 volts. Oh, look at that. And here we can see our movement advancing. This is just what my other clock looks like. This is very good. That means that all the mechanical parts of this movement are sound. We might have to do some work on the contacts, but I'm confident that now we can take the movement apart and get it cleaned up, and then we can figure out what we need to make this work. We are back with our cleaned and polished movement, and I've set up another lab to see if it's working as it should. I mentioned earlier the movement is essentially a switch that turns contacts on once a minute. And how it does that is power comes in through the frame of the clock, through this red wire here, and then the other side of the switch presents itself on this terminal, this terminal, and this terminal, 
at different points as the escape wheel rolls around. What I've got hooked up here is the other side of the power supply goes to the switch, the solenoid coil here. And if I move this red lead between these three terminals, we can determine if the clock is operating as it should. And this meter will tell us with a, a number when we have contact. The power supply is set to 20 volts and it's on right now. So I'm gonna start with this contact here, which is the front side of the escape wheel right there and we'll see what happens. I can see the terminal coming around. Should be pretty quick here. And ideally we'll see 20 volts on the meter. There it went, there's 20 volts on the meter and I can see the solenoid is engaged. And if I advance it again, now we go back to zero. So this contact is working, that's great news. Let's move our lead up here. And so this one is connected uh, right here. It's gonna capture the front pin on front of this little collar. And I'm gonna manually advance this again. We can see our pin is getting close. So again, we should see 20 volts here and we should hear our solenoid advancing because now I've attached the solenoid to this terminal. There we go, we're in contact now. We've got 20 volts on the meter and our solenoid is engaged. And if I advance this a couple clicks, now we're back to zero. As I mentioned, the, the clock that I worked on previously, the contact period is only about one second. And as you could see there, that was a half a dozen clicks of the escape wheel, meaning a half a dozen seconds or maybe a little longer than that. And that just seems to be the design that they made. We have this terminal to test now. And I'm a little concerned about this one because it is actually damaged. This came this way when I received the clock. Um, we're gonna just see what happens as I advance this. And I'm just looking at it right now. I'm gonna come up right about now. If it's gonna work, it should be working the next couple seconds here. And no good on that one. This one, um, I'm not surprised by this. It's, it's actually broken, some piece is missing. Um, I don't know that I have a great way of fixing that and that's out of scope of what this particular customer asked me to do. So we have a workaround that we can make. Again, this is just essentially a switch that turns on and off every minute. If we connect this working terminal to this terminal over here, then both of these switch outputs will operate from this contact and everything that's driven off the clock that way should still work. The consequence of that is they will be driven at the same time, which may require a little heavier duty power input and it may wear out this contact a little faster. But I do think that we should be able to make that modification and at least have my customer's clock drive all of the things that it's supposed to drive. So I'm gonna put this in the clock case that I have to make sure that this mechanically works and we'll take a look at it in that situation. I have the other movement mounted in my clock case and how the movement attaches to the rest of the clock in my movement compared to this one is fairly different. What we have is the one end of the switch coming through the frame as it is on my movement, so that just works. And then in my case, how I wind the movement is through this contact here, which normally uh, rides on the verge. So right now it's just attached to one of our three terminals here. When we were out in the shop, I was having problems with this rear contact. And so I put in a little jumper wire to make that work so that signal comes off of both of these. As I've been running it here, I've realized that it actually is working. And so if I leave it in this state, it's going to wind too much. It will wind uh, twice a minute rather than once a minute. So we've got a choice here. I can either leave the contact as is and remove this wire and then hope it works. Or I can say, all right, I'm, I question whether that contact is gonna be reliable. So I'm gonna leave the jumper wire in, but I could just lift this contact so it doesn't make contact with the back of the wheel. Uh, I'm gonna opt for historical originality and remove my jumper wire, uh, but you can see it should be set up to wind in a couple seconds here.
there it goes. So when I remove my temporary jumper wire, uh, I think this will be back in good running condition. I'm going to let it run for a number of hours to make sure that it's reliable mechanically. But I think we're done. So thanks for watching.